Hi everyone, my name is James Bezik and today I'm talking to Andrew Robinson about the value of lifetime spend. Hi Andrew, how are you doing? Hi James, good, thank you. So why is predicting customer lifetime spend such an important question for businesses who are using Stripe? So I think it's something that a lot of merchants can struggle with, especially when they are growing at a very large scale, probably operating in omnichannel environments where they're processing online, in-store, maybe they also have subscription use cases, potentially also processing all over the world. They can then find that in some scenarios, they might know a lot of information about that customer that's making the purchase. If it's an online order, for example, they're gonna know a name, an email address, a delivery address, and have information about that customer. But oftentimes with a, an in-person transaction, it's anonymous. You mm -hmm. don't know who the person is. You might know what it is that they've bought, but you don't know who that person is, and it can be really difficult to tie that in-store transaction that all you know is it's a card to an actual customer of yours and be able to then use that together to get a really great holistic view of what that customer is actually spending money on with you. Yeah, so what led you to explore this topic and how does it connect to your work as a solutions architect? So we actually had this challenge that was um, posed to us by one of the merchants that I work with at the moment at Stripe. Um, they are an omni-channel um, merchant and they had these challenges around identifying all of this spend and bringing it together. So um, they actually came up with a few suggestions from what they knew about the payments industry in general and we then looked at, okay, what can Stripe do to help with this? Um, made a few uh, internal conversations with some of our product managers and some of our engineering teams here and really got a bit more of a deeper dive into what some of those bits of data are that Stripe exposes and can expose that can help um, help our users with this. Um, pulling all of that together has then also meant that a lot of the other users that I work with that have the similar problem can then have a similar solution to help with it as well. So um, it was just a really interesting one for me because it, it's a big problem that a lot of merchants are facing and there's a lot that we can do to help them with it. Mm. What are some of the key data points um, that can really help you predict this lifetime spend? Yeah, so there's a lot that Stripe exposes through our API and through the objects that you use when you're interacting with Stripe, such as the payment method, payment intent and charge object. Um, we expose what we call a card fingerprint. Um, so this is, as the name suggests, a fingerprint that represents that card or that payment method. Um, some of the challenges that you find with that is when the, we're finding a lot more people now are using digital wallets, like some Google Pay, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and so on. And the way in which they work and tokenize the card means that you actually get different fingerprints, even though it's the same underlying card. Mm. Um, so that then presents a problem with using the fingerprint to do that sort of tracking with. Um, one of the other features that um, was announced in about 2014, um, it's called Payment Account Reference, also abbreviated to PAR, um, and this is a, a unique reference number that makes it much easier for merchants to be able to um, attribute a specific transaction with a specific person or customer. Yeah, let's dig into that. So, so what is PAR and how does that work specifically? Yeah, so the, the difference really between a PAR and other approaches to tokenization, um, such as the card fingerprint that Stripe uses, is the PAR is tied to the account holder rather than a specific PAN or card number. So this means that, for example, if I have a physical credit card and then I also have that added to my uh, Apple wallet on my iPhone and my Apple wallet on my watch, they're three separate card numbers in effect. Mm. But all three of those would return the same PAR from the card issuer. What's also good is then if I happen to lose my card and I get a new card issued, that then means that I have a new physical card number, new PAN for that. I have a new PAN on my iPhone and a new PAN on my Apple watch but the PAR value is the same. Um, what's also nice is even across multi-processors, the PAR value is the same. So if a transaction was processed on Stripe and then that same transaction was processed on WorldPay or Adyen, you'd get the same PAR value returned. So it could be really, really powerful because you now have a single consistent data point reference across all the different transaction types, even across different processes. Mm. Now, I know you work with a lot of customers. Do you find that there are elements in the data that's collected by Stripe that provide insights that are often overlooked by many of your customers? 
Um, I think there are, yeah. Um, so the payment account references is, is, mm. is one of those as well. Um, but some of the other areas that we also expose in there is with Stripe, you have the ability to attach metadata to different objects within Stripe. So a customer object, a payment intent object, payment method, charge, and so on. Um, and those data points, whilst they're not something that Stripe provides, it can then be attached to that object within Stripe. So for example, what some merchants will choose to do here is attach maybe uh, a order number for an online transaction. They might attach a receipt number for an in-person transaction from a point of sale. And that then means now that you're enriching that data set within Stripe and you then have access to be able to tie this specific charge in Stripe and you know who the cardholder was with this specific order that was placed in store. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're now starting to be able to join these dots together. Um, I think some of the other areas in there is we're seeing a lot of um, customers now who are moving towards using digital wallets, you know, the Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pays, and, and so on. Um, and Stripe actually exposes within our objects if it was a wallet that was used. So rather than as just showing the underlying card, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, and so on, we actually also expose if it was a, a Google Pay or an Apple Pay uh, transaction as well, which I think can help because it's then helping to show a few more of those little maybe macro trends that are being seen in the industry that yes, we are seeing a lot of customers now switching from using a physical card to contactless and now to mobile wallets. Mm. So for customers who are predicting this lifetime value, are they looking at present data or is there some historical context in the data they use to better predict this? Yeah, so um, with a lot of the features that we've talked about here, it all depends upon when you've started collecting that data from. Um, so a lot of the historical data, whilst it's possible to be able to use that, um, for things like the payment account reference and the card fingerprinting that we do at Stripe and displaying uh, the attributes related to whether it was a wallet purchase or a card or contactless, um, all of that, you know, you need the historical data to have to be able to then analyze and predict those future trends. So um, generally, yes, the data is available, um, but if you've been operating on Stripe for 10 years, you're going to have a much larger, richer data set than maybe a user who's only been operating on Stripe for a few months. Mm. Can you combine the, the data you have in Stripe with other data you've got in other external sources to improve your predictions? Absolutely, yeah. And this is where the metadata piece that I mentioned earlier really comes in here, that you now have the ability to have um, an individual charge payment intent object in Stripe that then has metadata related to the actual purchase that was made. So again, this could be an order number, it could be a receipt number, it could be to do with the physical location of where maybe the reader was that they made the transaction on. Um, you could even embed product information about the total basket amount and all of the different bits of metadata into the Stripe object. And then when you bring that externally into a data warehouse, you've then got all of those different data points that can help you to make those connections. So you would have maybe a charge object within Stripe, you'd then have the payment account reference, which would then help you to link that to a specific customer. Mm. You'd then have the order number that would then help you to link that to maybe your inventory system so you know what the person has ordered. And then you're now not just modeling this customer spends this much per year, but you're now able to say this customer buys these items online. They buy these items in this physical store, these items in this physical store. And then you're starting to now not just have a graph showing what they're spending, but being able to get way more granular on what they're spending in what location at what time of day and what products they're buying. Um, the knock-on impact of that is not only knowing your customer better, but it also means you can then start to do targeted marketing campaigns. You know, customers don't like, uh, I as a customer, don't like getting unsolicited, unrelated um, vouchers that I'm never ever going to use. Mm. But I do really like getting a voucher that is tied to something that I regularly buy and that I regularly want to buy. So if I'm a Stripe user, what is it I can do to have a better understanding of what my customers are spending money on and also predict what they might spend money on? Yeah, so, um, so I've already mentioned a little bit about some of those data sources that are available within Stripe, um, the attributes that are attached to the object. You know, these are all covered on the fantastic Stripe documentation. Um, but I think as well it's then what to do with that data. Um, and there's a few different ways of doing that. 
Um, you can analyze that data directly within Stripe. Um, so we have a product called Sigma, and this allows you to write your own SQL queries directly in the Stripe dashboard or via the API. So you can then join together distinct sets of data. Um, there's also the ability to uh, be able to get that data out into an external data warehouse, um, which is generally the approach I'd probably recommend. Mm -hmm. A lot of the larger merchants that are going to be um, looking at doing this analysis will already have a data warehouse that's already going to have a lot of customer information and customer data in there. Mm -hmm. And then bringing the Stripe data into there using data pipeline, um, you know, we can automatically ETL that into Parquet format directly into you know Snowflake and Redshift. So it can really help to streamline that. And then they've already got the analytic dashboard. Mm. Um, they've already done all the analysis. They've got the queries already written. So it can then come in and start enriching a lot of that data for them. Is there anything developers can do to automate some of this using the Stripe API? Yeah, so um, I've sort of touched on a little bit already around Sigma and data pipeline that are there available to help automating some of this. Um, also, if uh, a, I guess a closer to real time feed is needed. Um, all of this data is then also exposed through our webhooks as well. So when transactions are being processed in real time, you can then get a webhook. That webhook will have all of this data in as part of the event data, which you could then either take in and use in a real time analysis feed if you wanted to, um, but also there's the possibility to then have other actions triggered by that by taking those webhooks and having other actions fire off from them or using the Amazon Event Bridge integration, perhaps have Lambda functions firing off in the background to then do some further um, analysis of the data. Mm. So if somebody watching this video wants to get started with this today, what do you recommend as the first step? Um, so I think Stripe uh, documentation would probably be the first one to go on to on there. Um, there is a section on there on data analysis and it talks a little bit of not only around what data is available, but also some of the best practices for how to access it, how to analyze it, what some of the attributes are that you can expect. Um, also, I have to mention Stripe.dev, um, mm -hmm. have a look on there. There's some great blog posts on Stripe data analysis and what some of the data that's available is. Um, and also the Stripe Developers YouTube channel where there's going to be some, uh, some further videos on there and hopefully a video going into a little bit more detail about what we talked about today. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for joining us today. And if you'd like to learn more about what essays are doing at Stripe, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit Stripe.dev. Thanks for joining us.